thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you, the organizer, for inviting me. So let me see. I hope in this first lecture, I mostly plan to say rather easy things and just give an introduction. So I'm sorry if I bore the people who already know everything of this, but let me start. So I'm going to talk about uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equations. Let me try to not get the signs wrong. With uh, any degree, because almost everyone is familiar with this notation. And uh, the important thing that you have to consider is that I am working on a torus. So I'm taking the initial data in some HS from T2 to C. And I will try to give you some reasons of why I'm going to choose T2. But this is clearly just a choice. OK, so there's uh, lots of work on these things. And I'm taking a, uh, sorry, a slider than one, pretty regular <coughs> initial data. OK, so there's uh, lots of work known on well Posnet's results. Uh, and uh, but I'm going to look at very specific questions. So I'm going to look at special solutions. Here k is some parameter. Actually, the only important thing here is the sign, whether it's focusing or defocusing. And uh, I'm going to stick to the defocusing case. But uh, I, I mean, everything but the sign can be scaled out of, uh, from, uh, away from this. I guess this is trivial. And uh, what I'm going to say, in fact, does not depend uh, whether here I choose the sign plus or the sign minus, as a, uh, but uh, just to be specific. Okay. So when I say I'm going to look for special solutions, uh, means I'm going to take uh, some very uh, precise problem and uh, you know, just say everything about nothing. So these uh, solutions are absolutely not typical, which I'm going to discuss, but I think still they're interesting. And the first thing is, since I want to work in a perturbative setting, then uh, I have to decide that my initial data at uh, the HS norm is very small. OK? This will be my starting point. So I am, in fact, uh, taking an initial datum close to 0. But naturally, this does not mean that when I evolve, uh, the solution will stay with a small uh, HS norm. We, we know that the H1 norms should stay small, but the HS, no. You have bounds on how much it can grow, but this is a, essentially as much as I can say. So for the quasi period, so what are the special solutions that I want to produce? So I'll have quasi-periodic solutions, which are the ones I call the recurrent. So these are global solutions, and what is essentially an invariant torus inside the solution space. So I want the frequency, which will live in some Rn. This is with n frequencies. And I want that the uh, coefficients of this Rn are rationally independent. And then I want to map which from a torus Tn into my solution space. So here goes a function capital U of x and phi. And this capital U, my torus embedding, will live in Hs of T2 times Tn. So you see I'm, I have an n-dimensional torus. And then the relation is that my solution is simply capital U computed at x omega t. OK? I'm writing too big because I wanted to put here also the uh, energy cascade solution. Let's see if they fit. Which were the ones I called the diffusive. These are pretty famous from the paper of the I team. And the point is that I want to fix an x, which is larger than 1, a delta, which is small, a k, which is large. 
and then I want a solution. And I want that there exists a time such that the initial datum in HS norm is small and a time capital T it is large, the HS norm. Sorry. Okay. Well, um, in fact, uh, uh, these, uh, the fact that these kind of solutions exist for uh, the NLS, at least in the cubic case, uh, it was not uh, done by me. So these first results were by Geng Yu and Shu for the cubic NLS on T2. And uh, this, uh, the first result was by the I team. But then I will give uh, some literature. But uh, so what did I want to say? But uh, the works uh, I am referring to, I will have to erase this pretty quickly, are uh, on, uh, but if you have to want to consider any P, so not necessarily the cubic NLS, then uh, the result above was done by, w with, uh, so by myself, with my father, Claudio Crochesi. This is the quasi-periodic solutions. And then the second result uh, is uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Emanuele Haus and Marcel Guardia. I'm not used to writing on the blackboard anymore. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> okay, and but these are always for the question of taking p larger than one. Otherwise, it was already known since uh, like three or four years. So, why are these solutions interesting? Well, they're interesting because, uh, well, f first of all, uh, they are interesting per se because they have a very different nature. So I have uh, solutions in which the HS norm stays essentially put at all time. And these solutions, the quasi-periodic solutions, uh, if you look at them, it's very hard to distinguish them from a solution of the linear equation, except that the linear equation only has periodic solutions. But apart from that, they are very close to linear solutions. On the other hand, these solutions there uh, explicitly exhibit uh, behavior that one suspects has to happen, meaning uh, that uh, you start very small with the HS norm and you grow. But the reason why I like these solutions is because they are, uh, in some sense, they illustrate very nicely the application of uh, uh, paradigm of uh, applying uh, the techniques of finite dimensional dynamical systems to infinite dimensional dynamical systems. And they show very well the differences in uh, the two approaches. So I rather like it f f essentially for this reason here. So other things that I probably should justify, well, why do I work on, why did I decide to work on Torai? Well, essentially, because that's one is what is one is able to do. In fact, uh, uh, so you want a model of a compact manifold, uh, and you want to be pretty to know perfectly well the harmonic analysis, because uh, all the results are very much, at least how I construct them, are they're very much based on Fourier series. So in fact, uh, you could do a little bit better, at least for the quasi-periodic solutions. Uh, you could work, uh, for instance, on spherical varieties or Zoll manifolds, uh, or you could work on Lie groups. But still, it's, um, it's <coughs> quite complicated. And uh, the Taurus gives a very nice example. Computations are pretty explicit, and it's simpler. So once this, why T2? OK, T2 is a choice, or if you want a compromise. If uh, when you construct these solutions, for quasi-periodic solutions, the higher the dimension, the more complicated the result gets. On the other hand, for energy cascade solutions, if you reduce the dimension, things become harder because you have less resonances. And in fact, if you think P equal 1 and you take a, a one-dimensional case, then this is an integrable system which does not exhibit any growth of sub of norms. So it's quite clear. And also, again, uh, T2 for this uh, is not a choice. It's a necessity because we are absolutely not able to do the result on T1, 
On the other hand, we would be able, because it's trivial, to have results on higher dimensional terrain. So T2 is a reasonable uh, compromise, but I will try to give some other ideas. But then finally, well, why the NLS? Uh, again, because one is able to do it on the NLS, but uh, there are other types of results. Uh, and especially what I know better because I'm more expert in the field is uh, quasi-periodic solutions. Uh, and there you can play uh, games with other equations uh, like uh, the wave equation. Or this, but typically they have to be model equations. And if you want to work on a two-dimensional torus, you absolutely cannot accept derivatives in the nonlinearity. It would be very nice to be able to work with derivatives in the nonlinearities, but as far as I know, there is. Uh, Nobody knows how to do it. So once I have said all this, let me try to give you the dynamical system point of view. So I'm going to be in many ways deliberately naive. So the point of view is to try to think of this equation as uh, uh, a try to think of this equation as an equation on a sequence space. And obviously, if you want to think of the equation on a sequence space, what you should do is just pass to Fourier values. Okay. J of t. And then I am looking as a, the prob uh, at the problem as a problem on the sequence uj. And on the sequence uj, I have uh, the equations. I'm just writing them down for completeness. So I said I would choose k equal to, to be p plus 1. And so I have to remember it. <laughs> and then here, obviously, it, it does not look particularly nice. So, so I have uh, minus i minus y. So I'll try to write it. And then I have uj. OK, so I'm, what I'm doing is very, in a very naive way. I'm just uh, plugging inside the series. P is hmm? integer. P, ah, sorry, yes, I always forgot. P is integer. I really don't know what to do if P is not an integer. I would like to try to understand that, but I have. Uh, and there is a use of J missing at the mod J square. You're right. Thank you. OK, so this is just a Fourier series of this expression here. And apparently, I've done, well, uh, and I've done essentially nothing. I'm just writing it in a more complicated way at this point. But uh, I like to stick to this uh, uh, representation because here I see very nicely. OK, you, you see it also in the other notation. But what I like is that if I ignore that these are infinite sums and so completely <laughs> ignore the functional setting of the problem, what I have uh, is I have uh, a string of uh, um, oscill oscillators with the linear frequencies j squared. And then I have a coupling. And I can just try to put, plug in all the things that come from finite dimensional dynamical systems and which I, I knew a little bit about inside this setting. And the thing that you have to plug into is clearly the fact that if, you, if this were a finite dimensional system, this would be a finite sum. And so it would be clear that everything is well defined. Whereas here, even th this is an infinite sum. So even just to say that it's well defined, you, you need to put some structure in it. OK? And then, so other notations, other things that you have to remember, which are obviously even simpler to write in the full notation, but I want to write them here because I like it this way, is that this is a Hamiltonian system. This is the Hamiltonian, minus 1 to the i, j i is equal to 0, u j 1, u r j 2. This is rather boring to write down, but I think that if I start using two compact notations, then uh, it will be even heavier. And then uh, just. Remember, you have constants of motions. Well, this is all the trivial things that you already know from the NLS. There is no need to write it like this. This is the mass, so the L2 norm. And this, which is, in fact, 
two-dimensional vector is the momentum, which is saying that I have no explicit spatial dependence here, so I have translation invariance. Okay? Well, I like to write it here, and uh, when I write it in this way, so I, if I say that this is a, a Hamiltonian system, I should tell you which is the uh, Poisson structure. And the Poisson structure is, I hope I don't get the sign wrong, but it should be like this, possibly a minus here, because I don't remember. Well, Naturally, another objection that you could make is that typically when you write in finite dimensional dynamical systems, people usually use uh, real variables and not complex notation. So what does this mean? What is this function of u, u bar? What does it mean that this is the cl complex structure? Well, if you want, and again, uh, modulus design, just uh, pass to real notation by taking the real and imaginary part of u as, a complex, as a con symplectic variables. And then you will see that this is just uh, uh, uncoupled harmonic oscillators because this becomes uh, q squared plus p squared, which is the usual notation, and everything becomes what one is used to. It's just a question of taste. I like this better because here everything is diagonal. It's just a question of taste. So, uh, how do the blackbirds work? So, no, yeah, everything. No, you can, uh, yes, but if I push this up, I'll never get it down. But probably I don't want to get it down again. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, no, it's, just, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so. Well, again, yes, I, I wrote it down because I thought, ah, oh, there's three. Remember, Everything that I write needs to be specified. So for instance, you could think that you're working, so as I decided that my initial data was in a small ball in HS, so you can think that this is a symplectic space and, uh, and, and the space space is HS. Okay, so we take UJ in HS. And this is a reasonable uh, thing which makes everything well posed. But if you just ignore anything, and so what happens in finite dimensions? Well, so let me, I, I had an order in which I wanted to say things, so, so I'm going to check it. Yes, so, so ignore everything, and what does this look like? I make a picture here. You have uh, your Fourier points, so the UJs. And if I have no nonlinearity, nothing moves. But if I have a coupling uh, given by the nonlinearity, you have uh, on, uh, all the on all points that are coupled by the first relation that I wrote, which is the conservation of momentum, you have transmission of energy, and so you can spread. So at a linear level, uh, uj linear is just uj zero to the j squared t, okay? And then all these are constant. And then the quasi-periodic solutions means uh, that I have an initial datum, so that would be nice, ah, well, I, I'll just, so you have an initial datum that is concentrated on some points, wherever they are. I, I knew you had everything. <laughs> <laughs> so purple. Okay, I will take initial data, essentially concentrated on some points, which I'm calling S. And S is some subset of Z2, compactly supported, so it's a finite set. And the quasi-periodic solutions are solutions which essentially stay put. They stay on these sides at all times. While the other solutions, they start here and then uh, they move. They just uh, spread to higher and higher modes. And then if you spread the, the energy to higher and higher modes, you will get a higher Sobolev norm because increasing the Fourier modes increases the Sobolev norm. Okay? So this is my picture. 
And again, I am justified in doing this because if I think of finite dimensional systems, well, this is essentially what you expect. In fact, even in finite dimensional systems, so one of the, the, the main problem that I will have here is a lack of parameters to modulate. Because even in finite dimensional systems, it is well known that these kind of problems uh, have uh, small divisors inside them. And so they are not just uh, uh, trivial perturbation theory. It's true that you have a linear system plus something which close to zero is small, so you can consider it as perturbative. But you cannot solve, try to find these solutions by implicit function theory. It just will not work. And then what typically one does is uh, you do not look at one equation, you look at families of equations. So you look at an Hamiltonian made like this, where these are parameters. And then you have some nonlinearity. I'm just not going to write that because it becomes completely irrelevant. Let me just write the degree of the nonlinearity. Okay? Even in finite dimensional systems, you would like to have these parameters here. And then what you expect is that you have maximal to write. at least uh, for most choices of the parameters, you will have maximal tori, which are in, live in a positive measure set. Then you will have uh, stable and unstable lower dimensional tori, so tori which are not uh, of the Lagrangian, they have a smaller dimension, so stable. starting from periodic orbits and higher and higher dimension. And then, uh, the obviously, these are, are the kind of solutions that I'm looking for in the quasi-periodic case. And then, if you want to see the diffusive solutions, well, what you, what you do in finite dimensional system is that you construct co-dimension one unstable tori, okay? And then you prove uh, that if you have sufficiently many of these co-dimension one unstable tori, their stable and unstable manifolds must intersect. And uh, this intersection of stable and unstable manifolds gives you the Arnold diffusion, so gives you the movement in the action space. Okay, so let me write. Uh, one. All right. Stable and unstable manifold. And this will give you so what you will see is that you will start with an initial datum with uh, woof, with some action, and then you will get, after a long time, same Fourier mode with a very different action. So difference of the actions is uh, the other one. So if you have this picture in mind, uh, so the first problem, and this is uh, a seri very serious one, is that here we have uh, uh, no freedom in the parameters. So what you could do is say, well, instead of working with this uh, uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, add a potential and try to find solutions for most choices of the potential. This surely can be done, and in fact, uh, there are results in this direction uh, in both cases. But uh, here, we, we really did not want to do that, so we just wanted to see for that equation and that alone. And also, if you say uh, add a potential, it would be nice to know, so say that the potential is cosine of x and prove that the solutions have uh, the, your behavior, and that again would be uh, not possible to do. Once you have uh, removed that problem, in which I will discuss in detail after, you get all the problems of putting this finite dimensional <coughs> picture into an infinite dimensional picture. So the first point is that you're, we are absolutely not able to do maximal tori. Also, I, I would guess that you do not expect that solutions behave like this. I mean, you do not expect to have positive measure sets, whatever it means, where the solutions are infinite dimensional tori. In any case, uh, one is essentially unable to provide uh, 
to, to construct infinite dimensional terrain of any form, except by uh, really ch cheating a little bit, so adding lots of parameters, uh, or uh, maybe trying to put the regularizing, non uh, modifying the nonlinearity. There are results by Peschel, Bourguin, there is also Kirchia Perfetti on this. Uh, but none is really applicable to this model, even in one dimension. Say you take a one-dimensional cubic NLS plus some higher degree, you are not able to do that. So you just have to forget about this. And as you forget about this, you have to forget about also co-dimension one terai, because evidently these are infinite dimensional terai as well. I mean, they're completely beyond your reach. So what you should do is try to uh, have a, a finite dimensional structure embedded in your infinite dimensional setting. The problem is that now these kind of things are much less stable. So say that if you could prove that you have a finite dimensional invariant subspace, then there you, you could work everything with uh, no interest in the infinite dimensional setting. But you can't. So this is a question. And I think a good example, even if I have to wave my hands to tell you this, is uh, when uh, you try to construct the energy cascade solutions. Because there, the construction works like this. You can prove uh, that there exist sequences of unstable periodic orbits, okay, which would be very low dimension to I, and they are unstable. And naturally, once you have proved uh, that uh, the periodic orbit is unstable, you have a local stable and unstable manifold for these periodic orbits. So if you were to be able to say that these stable and unstable manifolds intersect, then you would have, uh, by very simple arguments, uh, an energy cascade solution. And you could actually do as many as you want, so you could go to infinity. But unfortunately, uh, when one tries to give the intersection argument here, you really use the codimension one, because you use that codimension one uh, manifolds have to intersect. And instead there, you, you have to use some much more volatile arguments. And that's the reason why here I am not able to go to infinity. I'm not able to construct that. Nobody is actually able to construct a solution which goes to infinity. Okay? This is because you're really doing computations with uh, low dimensional things which are more fragile mm -hmm. and this is, is uh, i mean this is a fact you mm -hmm. cannot modify this so i have said this i have said this at this point so let's see maybe i can write here a little bit of literature just to give you something more of an idea of uh, all the questions. So in fact, uh, the, the first thing that people did uh, is uh, to try to construct the low dimensional terai. And uh, they did it for model equations uh, with uh, adding the parameters by adding a potential or even being even more brutal in their computations. And the still, it was not a completely, I mean, it's not a, si a very simple problem, but there are results essentially starting from the 90s. And lots of people, but Kuxin, uh, and the two in combination, Craig and Wayne. Okay did a lot of stuff. And um, so this is all if you take on the circle. So this is a pretty well-known stuff. And now the interesting points uh, in quasi-periodic solutions, I mean, the things that I find most interesting are trying to do the same kind of results, at least in dimension one, by adding derivatives. So here, uh, I'd like to mention the works by who worked on fully nonlinear equations. And also for a fully nonlinear NLS, there is myself with Roberto Feola. OK, so you consider that equation, you take it on the circle, and you put uh, as, ma as many as two derivatives in the nonlinearity and prove the existence of stable and unstable periodic orbits. 
when you go uh, to higher dimensions, well, you just have to give up the derivatives, but there are, uh, again, results by Bourdain. Then the paper that is more similar to the things that I am going to try to tell you is the papers by Cookson and Eliasson, which did that model there, but added a potential in order to remove uh, the uh, degeneracy. And uh, well, as I told you, coming to exactly that equation, the, there's, uh, the, the, the result on the cubic NLS was uh, gang U and Shu. Uh, very tough paper, but extremely nice if you look at, want to look at it. And uh, then the results that I mentioned with my father, and also there are works by Wang, Wai Ming Wang. And she also studied the nonlinear wave equation, I'd like to mention, always without parameters on high dimensional to write. And uh, while this result here was very much uh, f uh, given on T2, and it works by their mechanism just on T2, you can uh, do uh, any dimensional to write. So this result and the result I've read it like this with my father is uh, uh, in any dimension, any NLS, any dimension. The interesting thing, which uh, maybe not today, but other, another, I will try to convince you, is uh, that uh, if you take the approach uh, from uh, our paper, you can uh, prove uh, stability, or at least linear stability of your solutions, which I feel is interesting because it's nice to know if you have a stable and unstable uh, uh, solution. And also, it's nice to be able to work on the linearized equations. And this you can do. But it's uh, a serious price you have to pay. It's uh, like. 70 pages proof even for the cubic NLS to construct, to understand which solutions are stable and unstable. But you can do it. As for the, so I can write them here, for the energy cascade solutions, uh, well, uh, the first results were the I team on the cubic NLS and T2. And then Kalashin and Guardia, always cubic NLS with time estimates. And then there's the results I'm talking about. But also, I should mention, there are also results uh, on uh, uh, other systems, like, for instance, there are the results by, Patrick Gerard, uh, by Gerard and Grelier on uh, the Zego equation and the half wave. And uh, the results, which are more similar here, on uh, the NLS equation on uh, T2 times R, which uh, are, uh, help, Hani, Zvetkov, Vishilia, and I'm forgetting. Posade. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody knows these results. <laughs> OK. So. At this point, I have uh, bored you enough with all the presentation, and I can uh, uh, start making some computations and some proof. But uh, um, no, I still wanted to say something before I, I get to the real stuff. I wanted to give you an idea of uh, what uh, these, uh, my statements look like at the end when I'm really trying to prove them. So I said everything is a question of modulating parameters. Uh, and quite clearly, the only parameters that I can modulate uh, are the initial data. So what is the kind of statement? Uh, then still is in a very vague statement. So let me fix my set S, which I said was a finite subset in Z2. I know. And let me call S the points V1 up to Vn. OK, so I'm just calling these points Vi. And the quasi-periodic solutions say for 
most s. And obviously, I have to say what this means. There exists many, again, I have to say, quasi-periodic solutions. And these quasi-periodic solutions stay on S, which was I was telling you uh, informally when I made that picture there. So essentially, OK? Well, we essentially support it on S at all times. Uh, what I mean is that uniformly in time, you can uh, uh, control uh, with a very small parameter the difference between uh, the whole solution and its projection on this finite subset S here. OK? Everything is uh, at all times uh, very much on S in high sub of norm, let's say. OK? So, well, the, the two things that are extremely vague is this most and this many. Well, uh, many is easy to say because uh, here, essentially, you can parameterize uh, the quasi-periodic solutions with the frequency. So just let me define a small ball inside the frequency space in which this is omega in Rn such that minus squared. So I'm saying that the height frequency is very much close to the linear frequency. Okay. And uh, at this point, I have a counter set inside the, this little ball, and this counter set has positive measure. And for all frequencies in the counter set, whoop, there exists a quasi-periodic solution of frequency omega. You see? And this parameterization at this point is bijective because different frequencies will give you different solutions. So uh, many in a uh, sense which just this, I have a f I fix any n, and then I fix the frequencies sufficiently close to the expected linear frequencies, and I find a solution there. What is uh, at this point not defined is what does it mean, this most s. But this is a delicate question, because I have to give you a definition on how to uh, choose uh, uh, points uh, in a lattice. So what are good points and bad points? Certainly, what is true is that if uh, you give me a box inside Z2, so you decide that you want to choose your frequencies inside a box of radius r, then uh, the things that I have to remove uh, are, uh, well, essentially, they are uh, co-dimension one algebraic manifold. Okay? But uh, they are uh, really, you have to remove a very thin, a very uh, small number of uh, frequency omega in a box. And anyways, I will make that clear, but I need to give all the definitions. So this is what you should uh, be watching for. What is this most uh, uh, S means? And then when I have my uh, energy cascade solutions, in fact, you can play a, a very simple game. If you give me any set S, like uh, in the quasi-periodic solutions, I can produce on this set S an unstable uh, quasi-periodic solution. Actually, I, I will produce an unstable periodic solutions. And then I can provide, uh, so given S, I can give you another set, which I can call S2. And I can construct initial data. Initial data such that u0 is uh, on s, and at some large time t, ut is on this set s2. OK, this is a rather simple thing to do. You have a uh, uh, set like this. You prove that you have on this set an unstable periodic solution, and you prove that from this unstable periodic solution, you can construct initial data close to this unstable periodic solution which drift. 
The hard thing, once you have this, uh, is that you want to play this game in such a way that uh, this uh, uh, initial sub OLF norm is small and this final sub OLF norm is large. And this is a much harder question. But just uh, proving that you can drift, uh, uh, so that, that you can make a change in the actions, uh, provided this change is not too big, that's quite easy. And I will think I can show that directly. <coughs> So once I have this, uh, I will s go, uh, I'll manage the time better than I thought. So once you have all this, in order to start doing things, I have to take, so if you have no external parameters in finite dimensional systems, but I would guess in any case, what you try to do to your equation is to apply at least one step of Birkhoff normal form. And uh, see if uh, in the Birkhoff coordinates <coughs> you have a nicer picture. And in fact, you do. So mm -hmm. I am trying to decide. I think I can erase these things. And we have the construction of the solution. What is the Birkhoff normal form? The Birkhoff normal form is a change of variable defined in some ball. And here, since at this point I'm thinking of the quasi-periodic solutions, I will take a small ball inside HS. And I have my change of variables, which maps this ball into some slightly larger ball. And this is a symplectic change of variables. And when you compute your Hamiltonian in the new variables, you will get a nicer picture in this sense. Here, I have a polynomial of degree 2p plus 2, but which is resonant. And I will define what it means. And here, I have a remainder, which is of higher degree. So this is the degree of uh, this, uh, the minimal degree of this as a, uh, as a polynomial, okay? And here, uh, H resonant is just a projection of the nonlinearity of the Hamiltonian onto the subspace uh, of analytic functions which Poisson commute with uh, the term of degree two. So uh, in particular, what you will have, but then I, I will compute, is that the Poisson bracket between this is zero, OK? And this defines this uh, polynomial uniquely. I, can, I will compute it for you explicitly. So uh, well, at this point, naturally, if this were a finite dimensional system, everything would be fine because I can say that this is of degree 4p plus 2. So if you're sufficiently close to zero, this is a small perturbation with respect to this system. And I can try to look at this system and uh, study its dynamics uh, and uh, deduce uh, the dynamics of the NLS over some larger time uh, interval. And then uh, if I want to construct the quasi-periodic solutions, I can do perturbation theory, thinking of this system here as my unperturbed system and of H for P plus 2 as a perturbation. Well, naturally, in order to say this, I have to convince you that this is really small and we are in infinite dimension. But in fact, this is not a problem for the NLS. Uh, and you can prove uh, that if you look uh, at the, the map, from this ball B epsilon 0 of HS, so I have U in here, to the Hamiltonian vector field of this small remainder. This uh, is an analytic map. And this I can think of it as inside HS. Okay? And so this means uh, that, in fact, this is really small because uh, the, vec the Hamiltonian vector field uh, just give is well posed. Uh, and it gives me a very small correction with respect to the Hamiltonian vector field of this part of the dynamics here. So this uh, is because I'm choosing a rather simple equation, so the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. 
if uh, I had, for instance, that the linear frequencies, these here, were not integers, so say you have a wave equation with some mass, or if you had uh, derivatives uh, in the nonlinearity, then the question would be obviously quite more delicate. But here it's uh, very simple. You can find it in essentially any book. And uh, it's a completely trivial question. And another remark is that, in fact, I do not need to take uh, a small ball in HS. I could uh, work with a small ball in L1. And then the change of variable would still have all the properties that I'm saying, particular this. OK? And question here, having an irrational torus will be easier or more difficult? Having an irrational torus would mean that you have, no, it would be simpler. Because you have, uh, when you look at this commutation rule, the kernel is much <coughs> smaller. And then you have a much simpler uh, resonant piece. But then, well, it depends on what you want to do, because if you want to do this, then uh, it's More much, difficult. yes. For the, first one <laughs> For the first one, it would be significantly simpler. Yes. Yes. So, okay, so once we are here, I have to co just, uh, so what is the scheme? I, uh, I'll say it again, because I just got lost. Um, what my scheme will be that I have to, I want to compute this resonant piece explicitly. I want to say that, so for uh, the f this result here, which is a finite time result, uh, and essentially I'm done because what I want to say is that I can prove uh, the existence of the energy cascade solutions for this system here. So ignore the perturbation. And then I want to show that uh, this, uh, my energy cascade solution occurs in a time scale in which I can consider <coughs> this as a perturbation. And so just prove a continuation result. If you want to do the quasi-periodic solution, then this is uh, more subtle because uh, uh, it's not finite time. And at some point, you will have to consider this as a perturbation. But the point is uh, that you will, uh, what you can show is that you know sufficiently well the structure of this uh, system here, and you really can do a KM theorem thinking as of this as an unperturbed system and just this as the perturbation. And use, uh, for instance, or oh, oh I erased it, for instance, essentially use the KM theorem by Cuxin and Eliasson. And, uh, so it was uh, more or less already given. So the whole point uh, in everything before taking into account this piece here is to be able to study the dynamics given by what I, I would call the Birkhoff Hamiltonian. So uh, as a first step, explicitly compute this piece here. And well, I can use this. So. I said I have to compute uh, the projection of uh, the term of degree 2p plus 2 onto the kernel of the adjoint action of this operator here. g squared. I forgot the sum here, obviously. So j j squared, u j squared. Okay? This is a linear operator acting on Hamiltonians. And I want to compute the kernel. So the nice thing about complex uh, variables is uh, that this operator is diagonal over monomials. So if I just use, uh, excuse me, the atrocious notation, but I have to do it. So I'm uh, denoting a monomial u j1, u bar j2, u j 2p plus 1, u bar j 2p plus 2. I did not need to. OK? And j is just the sequence 2p plus 2 plus j1, j2, j whatever. And uh, so I compute the Poisson bracket, in fact, of any linear expression of this type against the monomial. Then what I get is this, lambda j1. Uh, there's an i, and possibly there's a sign, because I never get signs right j2 plus lambda j3, and then I go on. Uh, what do I get? I end with a minus lambda j to p plus 2 times the monomial mj. So you see, 
Mj is an eigenvector of uh, this adjoint action, and this is the eigenvalue. Okay? So when I have to compute the projection of that expression there, then this is extremely simple. And uh, I will write my Birkhoff Hamiltonian, which I call H Birkhoff. But notice if you're used to this notation, it's just uh, the Birkhoff normal form after one step of. Uh, you could do better, but in fact, it does not seem to help in any way. So I just stopped after one step of Birkhoff normal form e squared. And here, I have my monomials. I'll, I'll just write them again, rj2, et cetera, to u, j2, p plus 2. So this is even, so it has a bar. But now, I have uh, extra commutation rules. So I have commutation with the momentum, which is the rule that I wrote. You see, minus 1 to the i, j i equal to 0, sum over i. That's clearly conservation of it's a, a rule of Poisson commuting with m there. OK, so I have uh, minus 1 to the i, j i equal to 0. And then I have my extra rule. So it's minus 1 to the i. My lambda j is just mod j squared, so j i squared equal to 0. OK? And now you see that so what is the point? The point is quite clearly, if this lambda j were rationally independent, or say that uh, no combination of 2p plus 2 lambda j can be 0, then the only way to have uh, this uh, Poisson structure is uh, that this uh, sequence is uh, trivial. And I will define it, but uh, imagine that you have j1 equal to j2, j3 equal to j4, and so on. Then obviously, this term will be 0. Okay? So let me give you my definitions, because they will be helpful. My first definition is a resonance. Resonance is a sequence of vectors j1, j2, j2p plus 2. Uh, wait, let me, when I put the, I don't know how to say, the round bracket, I'm meaning that these are ordered. I do not want to mix the components. Because at least uh, you see from this formula, I can, cannot exchange an even with a not with an even number. It will not give me uh, the same monomial. OK, so a sequence like this, uh, such that minus 1 to the i, uh, i goes from 1 to 2p plus 2, j i is equal to 0, and the sum minus 1 to the i, j i squared is equal to 0. OK? So here I could substitute the sum with the sum over the resonances. And sometimes, since here I have fixed the number of points, uh, I will call this uh, a resonance uh, of uh, order 2p plus 2. So a resonance of order 4 is j1, j2, j3, j4, and so on. OK? And now a trivial resonance. Uh, Well, a trivial resonance means that if I look at the odd indexes, j1, j3, j5, help, j2, p plus 1, this, as an, an unordered sequence, is equal to the sequence of the events, even ay, 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 modes, j2, j4, up to j2, p plus 2. OK? Why do I call this a trivial resonance? Well, because uh, something of this form is always a resonance. And, uh, and also, uh, something of this form, I mean, it's a resonance not because uh, of what this, uh, the linear frequencies are. No matter what is the linear frequency, so take any equation, 
with any linear frequency, Laplacian squared, whatever you want, and the trivial resonance will always appear in the diff of normal form. Okay? And also, it uh, essentially does not move anything because if you have a trivial resonance, then you can see that your monomial is in fact a function of the actions. Okay? So if you have a trivial resonance, u j1, u bar j2, etc., u bar j2, 2p plus 2, I'm starting to hate this. Then uh, you can write this as uj1 mod square, uj3 mod square, and so on, up to uj 2p plus 1 mod square. Okay, so it's obvious uh, that it was some commutes with this, whatever is, uh, are the linear frequencies. But on the other hand, something of this type here does not move uh, the actions in any way. They're still constants of motion. Okay, so if you only have trivial resonances, uh, then your Birkhoff Hamiltonian here is an integrable system and it's integrable in the most trivial way. All the linear actions are constants of motion. But the point is that in our case uh, of uh, uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on T2 and even on the circle, if you take P larger than 1, you can produce non trivial resonances in a very simple way, which I'm going to show. So, and, and which means that it's not true that the actions are constants of motion. So let me, the, the, the very famous resonances are the resonances for uh, uh, the cubic NLS. So you can see that J1, J2, J3, J4 form a non-trivial resonance if they form a rectangle. J4. Okay. Just plug the rectangle relation and you will see that it is a resonance. And also that if it is a resonance of order 4, then it has to be a rectangle. It's just a simple computation. Okay. And then, well, just look at it. It's uh, also, why did I put the points like this? I have to remember that I have to be able to exchange J1 and J3 without moving any other points. Because if you look at the monomial, you can exchange any odd uh, coefficients one with the other. And this is true, I can exchange J1 with J3. But if I want to exchange J1 with J2, I have to exchange J3 with J4 because it's a complex conjugate. And then I have to use the fact that the Hamiltonian is real. So this is a simple way of remembering how to put place the indexes on the rectangles. Okay? But then once I have a, a resonance of order 4, it's completely trivial to produce a resonance of higher order from a resonance of order 4 because you just take J1 j2, j3, j4, then choose uh, any uh, Fourier index j. It could be one of these, it could be another, and just repeat it until you arrive to your j2p plus 2. Okay? And this is clearly a resonance because when you substitute in your relations, you have that all these cancel out both from the linear relation here, because you have a j and a minus j, and from the quadratic relation, okay? So it's very simple to produce uh, higher order resonances. But in any case, you, you, you do not have only rectangular resonances, you can have uh, other things. So for instance, I, I never get this, so I have to copy it. Voila. So I can produce a resonance of order 6 uh, already in dimension 1, and this resonance is like this. 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 2, and 2. This is from uh, the paper of Greber and Thoman. And uh, you can check that this is in fact a resonance of order 6 by just computing. So let's try it. I have to do J1 minus J2, so I get 2, plus J3 minus J4, I get 4, I'm getting lost, minus 2, 2, minus 2, 0, okay? And then you try it with the squares and it's the same thing, just don't have me, okay, well, 
1 to the square 1 minus here minus 1 is 0 and all these cancel because they're just one the square of the other and so this is obvious but naturally once again once I have a resonance of this type I can produce a resonance of higher order by again adding j j j as many times as I want and also I can make this uh, this is a resonance in which the v live inside Z and not Z2, but obviously I can plug this in Z2 in many ways, the simplest being that I just add zero here. This is a somewhat stupid way because this is a, in fact a one-dimensional solution, but certainly it works. And also I could write other numbers here. Uh, for instance, I could just plug one minus one, one minus one, one minus one everywhere. And uh, sorry, one, one, o all the same number or plug exactly this uh, here or any permutation, whatever. I mean, you can play the game in any way you want. And uh, you can also produce more complicated solutions and we had some fun producing uh, resonances at some point. But, uh, probably not really that amusing, but you can do it. Okay, so uh, surely you have lots of uh, non-trivial resonances, which means that this Hamiltonian does not preserve the linear actions. But still, I will, uh, I'm, I'm not able to use the three blackboards efficiently. I'm, I guess, a two blackboard person. So I'll write the statement of the lemma here, and then I will write the proof somewhere else. So Notwithstanding the fact that this is not a system which preserves the linear actions, I have this uh, really nice proposition. Not only it's nice, but it's also easy to prove, which is even nicer, which says the following thing. For and now you will finally see what I meant with the most choices of S for generic. S, which I remind you is a set V1 up to Vn, which I wisely just erased, but okay. For generic S, the following holds. So one, if you take this finite dimensional subspace, so you have uh, your sequence of Uj is in Hs, and uh, Uj is equal to zero for all J, which is in S, uh, sorry, is in Z2 minus S, which is a set which I will call S complementary. Okay? So I, here I am looking at the uh, solutions which are completely supported on my finite set S. So this is a finite dimensional subspace. And the interesting thing is that this US is invariant. For, uh, not for the NLS dynamics, that would be asking really too much, but it's invariant for the Birkhoff Hamiltonian. And the other thing is uh, that, again, for generic choices of S, uh, if you compute uh, the Birkhoff Hamiltonian restricted to US, then this uh, is integrable. And uh, all the uj squared are constant of motion. And in fact, I can be even more precise. The Birkhoff Hamiltonian restricted to us is just j squared uj squared j in s plus the sum over the trivial resonances with j in s of u j1 over j2, etc. I I I did the hash with the notation, so you introduced the notation m j so Ah yes <laughs> it's true. You're right. Just said, I'm always afraid that people will forget what this is. And so I, at <laughs> this point, I've become used uh, to writing it all. In fact, uh, what I, the notation I like best, and since I 
do have five minutes before proving this thing is uh, to write this Hamiltonian in this form here. So you have uh, my H, Birkhoff, restricted to US. And I like to write it like this. This is uh, the piece which is obvious. And here, I because what I don't like of this notation is that you have many monomials which are the, in fact the same monomial. So you do not know. I mean, you have to compute what is the coefficient. So if you really want to write the Taylor series, then you get this, which I, I find nicer. And I will explain, obviously. So alpha is uh, alpha, alpha of, so the alpha j's are defined with j in z2. And this is a sequence indexed by z2. So alpha is in n times z2. OK? And then what this means, uh, u squared to the alpha means uh, the product j in z2 of uj squared to the alpha j. OK, so this is in fact a monomial. And this uh, is a multinomial coefficient. So yeah. is just d plus 1 factorial divided by the product of the alpha j factorial. And since uh, the sum of the uh, alpha j is finite, this is a finite number, and this is a monomial. Okay? So what I like in this is that here you really have the honest uh, Taylor series of this expression. I'm sorry, I, I wrote everything in Z2, but obviously, yes. <laughs> sorry. Everything is in S. I'm, I'm starting to be tired. This is a finite uh, Taylor series, so this is even better. Because I was thinking, obviously, of the representation of the trivial resonances in the full space and not in the finite dimensional substance. OK? Well, if you want to prove this, the simplest thing, I have like five minutes? Yes. I will prove uh, my statement for the cubic NLS where it is trivial. And uh, I, I actually didn't think I would make it to any proof. I thought I would just state it, but well, I was fast. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I never told you what generic means. So I have to say that before trying to give any proof. So what is uh, a generic point? So if you have a point x in some space, and I think of the complexes, CR, then uh, <coughs> x is generic with respect to some polynomial, a polynomial p of x, mapping CR into C, if, uh, sorry, let me write p of y, if when you, blah, 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 I'm starting to, so I have a polynomial p of x. And then I have a point, which I'm calling x0. And what does it mean that x0 is generic if when you take your polynomial and you compute it at x0, this polynomial is not 0? OK? This is a very standard definition of generic. Obviously, the only thing that you have to be careful is that this polynomial should not be identically 0. Otherwise, anything does a oh, But this is, in fact, the, 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 the heavy part of everything. OK? So now, well, when I think of my set S, I can surely embed it in some uh, CR, because uh, S is V1 up to Vn. And each of this is a two-dimensional vector. So S, I can think of it as a point inside C to N. It's true that these are integer numbers, but certainly they are inside C to N. I could embed it inside R to N, but I really like giving definition on complexes when I'm thinking about polynomials, because then I do not have to worry about real roots or things like that. It seems more reasonable. And, uh, and well, this was done with my father, and he doesn't even conceive that things should be real with regard to polynomials. So. <laughs> 
And then, okay, so what I have to do, what I mean when I say generic, I mean that I will produce a polynomial for you, and uh, this polynomial uh, will give me the genericity. And uh, if uh, my point uh, V1, Vn is not a zero of this polynomial, then I have my result. So you see, it really is most points. And uh, also, the nice thing, and then I stop because uh, I do not have time, is that if uh, you take n to be equal to 4, let's say, and I want to give, no, let's, let's do it even simpler, n is equal to 3. I have v2, v3, OK? Then how do I ensure, then here I can give you a completely uh, explicit, because my polynomial is a polynomial of v1, v2, v3, and it's just v1 minus v2 against v1 minus, sorry, v3 minus v2. This is the scalar product. And uh, I'm, I'm starting to go too fast, and I will I'll start again with the proof of this. But the point is that you see that four resonances are rectangles. And it's quite simple to see that if you take three points, and these three points do not form a right angle, so this would be J V1, this would be V2, and this would be V3. And if they do not form a right angle, which is exactly requiring that this polynomial is not zero, then you cannot form resonances with these points. Because even if you added a, four point, you could, uh, a fourth point, you could never make a rectangle. You could certainly make, uh, choose a fourth point so that this is verified, because this is a pa parallelogram, I don't know the word. But you cannot make also this, because this is a rectangle. And this will be the basis of my proof. But if I add points, uh, and if I had the more complicated resonances, obviously I will not have such an explicit expression for the polynomial. But that's essentially all there is to this uh, proposition here. OK, thank you. Because I'm thinking of this as a point. Okay, so you can always think of a subset of a finite subset as a point inside C2n. So set the generic if the whole point is. Yes, the set is generic if the corresponding point is generic. And I have to tell you what the. So, okay, so what is the generic set? On the Any triple po of points which do not form a, uh, a right angle. Because if you take these three points and you go and compute this polynomial here. Ah, so, you said this is certainly not generic? No, this is generic. Generic is uh, if the polynomial is not zero. So, if I take these three points. They do not form a right angle, and then this polynomial is not zero, and then it is generic. Okay? The three points like this. Yeah, yeah, I, I went. I so if you prefer, can I reformulate the proposition by the fact that there exists a polynomial such that for yes. every s, such that p of s is not zero, then the polynomial. Exactly. There exists a polynomial, yes. But the polynomial will depend. Uh, naturally on the degree of the of NLS, course. yes. But the, yes, uh, you're right. I should have uh, yes, written the existence. The, <laughs> the degree of the polynomial is always two. As in this case, well, OK, no, if you want just one polynomial, the degree will depend on p. If you, uh, otherwise, no, I, I was saying it uh, in a wrong way. So you can think of your polynomial as one polynomial of degree in the cubic NLS, it's uh, uh, n choose 3. n is the number of point choose 3, because I have to take all the triples. And if I had the higher order NLS, the degree of the polynomial would go. In fact, if you take p going to infinity, you will have less and less generic points. This is uh, a fact that I should mention. Okay.